نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين اللهم الهمنا رشدا وعزنا من شرور انفسنا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته سوره التوبه this is a surah which was revealed in madina it has 129 verses and 16 stanzas it is ninth by the order of arrangement and 113th by the order of revelation and it is the second surah second and the last surah of the two surahs which were revealed in madina in the second group of the quranic surahs the name is because in this while explaining the conditions and the events of the tabuk expedition allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has narrated the events of uh, seeking forgiveness and the repentance of the companions of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so with reference to that it is called as surah at-tauba and then it is also named as surah birat because right at the start allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the surah by saying bara'atum min allah wa rasulihi so with reference and relation to that it is also known as surah al birat the time period of revolution is that it has basically four parts related with the time when the verses were revealed from the start the first stanza to the fifth this is the part which was revealed after 9 years of immigration of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to medina and in 9 ah when uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had uh, with a group of pilgrims they had uh, they were led by hazrat abu uh, bakr radhiyallahu ta'ala and who they had left medina for pilgrimage these were the verses which were revealed at that time then from the stanza number 6th to 9th this uh, all these uh, verses they were revealed while the preparations for the tabuk expedition they were being carried out and uh, the verses were to encourage the people to go for jihad and also to spend in the path of allah the stanza number 9th to the 16th these verses they were revealed when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, when uh, by with the help of allah they turned the muslims were victorious and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was returning from the tabuk expedition and the, the conditions they were uh, mentioned and they were discussed and guidance for the future is also been given in these verses this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with the verse right away bara'atum min Allah wa rasulihi ila allazina ahattum min al-mushrikeen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is declaring he says this is a declaration of disassociation from Allah and his messenger to those with whom you made a treaty among the polytheists so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is announcing and starting the surah with a proclamation or a declaration one of the manner of surah tauba which we realize is that it is starting without bismillah rahman rahim why is this so there have been many reasons which have been explained in commentaries some say that surah anfal and surah toba they are basically just one chapter and uh, because both have a topic of jihad and qital that is battles in the path of allah so since they are the same chapter so there is no bismillah rahman rahim before surah toba as it is not the sixth uh, not the starting of the next chapter 
But this explanation, this doesn't seem correct because they are two separate chapters as they've been given two separate names, Surah Al-Anfal and Surah At-Tawbah by Prophet Sallallahu himself. The second reason which is explained is that the start of the surah is with the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is de declaring a disassociation with some people, with the people of the polytheists of Mecca. And uh, so it is highlighting the anger and the wrath of Allah. And hence, it seems inappropriate to mention the traits of Rahman and Rahim prior to the verse which is announcing the anger and the wrath of Allah. Now, the third and the most appropriate reason is that Prophet Sallallahu whom on whom, on whom were the verses and the chapter on whom they were revealed, he did not ask those who were writing to write Bismillah before him. And uh, so that seems to be the most appropriate of all the reasons. Now, the ma manner of uh, reciting Bismillah before Surah Toba is what? That when we continue the recitation of Surah Toba after completing Surah Al-Anfal, then no Bismillah will be recited. The second is that when we start the recitation of Quran from the start of Surah Toba, that is like we are doing it today, then even then we will not recite Bismillah from the start also. But if like we have recited three or four stanzas or like 30 or 40 verses of Surah Toba in one sitting, and then we're going to start from the sixth stanza or from the 30th uh, verse, and we're going to start the recitation from there. Then we will recite Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim then. And uh, before going through the first five stanzas, I will briefly explain the background when they were revealed and the conditions so that we can relate to the message more clearly. We know that in the eighth year after migration to Mecca, there was the victory and there was the conquest of Mecca. Now in the ninth year, when there was Hajj, Prophet Sallallahu sent Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq ta'ala and who as the leader of the pilgrims of Mecca and he did not uh, go himself. In the ninth year, Prophet Sallallahu did not perform his Hajj himself. He uh, only made Hajj uh, on the 10th year of a pilgrimage, a 10th year after migration. Now, appointment, this appointing of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq who as the leader of the group of people of Hajj, this was an indirect indication by Prophet for the selection of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq as the first caliph after the death of Prophet There have been some other pointers of uh, for his caliphate also, like Prophet Sallallahu ordered uh, to uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq Razillahu Ta'ala and who to lead the congregational salah in the mosque in the last days when Prophet Sallallahu could not lead the congregation when because of his illness. Then Prophet Sallallahu ordered, it has been reported in Bukhari, to close all the doors and the windows which were extending from the courtyard of masjid e nabi other than those which were towards the courtyard of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Because he would need a frequent entering and leaving the masjid when he became the caliph. The third reason which, is, uh, which we can relate is Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's saying that there is no person on the earth well, to whom I am indebted and did not repay him except Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu because whose kindness I just could not repay the kindness of uh, the stay in the night of the cave of Sor. So this is to clarify a misconception because there are, uh, there are a group of people, there is a sect of the Muslims who say that Hazrat Ali ta'ala who was entitled to be the first caliph and that Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq ta'ala and who he deprived him of his due right. So after the pilgrims left, 
these verses of the first five stanza, they were revealed and they were to be announced on the day of Hajj. So Prophet وسلم, teaching Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who these verses, um, he, uh, he sent Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala to recite these verses on the day of Hajj as an announcement from Allah and his prophet for all of the known believers of Makkah. Sending of Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was not an indication of his succession as a caliph after the death of Prophet Sallallahu because this was the custom of the people of Arabs that if uh, the person had to make an announcement on the day of Hajj and he could not go himself, then the nearest male relative was made to go and do so. And since Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who was to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam his nearest and dearest male relative, so Prophet sallallahu alayhi sent him instead of going himself. Now, the points of the main points or the key points of the declaration which was made on the day of Hajj and were announced in these first five stanzas, <clears throat> the main points of declaration was, number one, that the disbelievers of Makkah, they were given four months of waiting period starting from 10th Zilhaj. <coughs> they were announced, it was announced that they have 10 periods, uh, 10 months, uh, four months of a waiting period starting from the 10th of Zilhaj. In these four months, they could all stay over in Makkah. And in these four months, they were uh, asked to just go around and observe the Islamic system of life, the Islamic system of government, interact with all the Muslims and observing all. If they felt attracted towards the beauty of Islam, they could embrace Islam. And then if they converted and they were Muslims, they would be permitted to stay in Makkah. But if they did not convert to Islam, they will not be permitted to carry on staying in Makkah. Because we know that from now onwards, Makkah was now the religious center of the Muslims. And non-Muslims not allowed in Makkah was why? Because this was announced as a rule for Makkah by Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so now, if they choose to stay in disbelief, then being non-Muslims, they will have to vacate Makkah by the rules of the state, because the rules of the state of Makkah were obviously the rules of Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, and if they disagreed, that is, if they did not uh, accept Islam, and they disagreed and they disobeyed this rule of vacanting Makkah, then because of the state disobedience, there will be war announced against them. This was only fair. This was a fair law announced well in time. And they were given a fair time period also to see for themselves, to decide for themselves. They were not forced. They were not pressurized. They had an open option of doing whatever they wanted to, whatever they pleased to do. So there was no urgency of vacating also, but they were given a convenient four months of period to wind up their businesses and pack off their domestic matters and then shift out easily if they preferred to be non-Muslim still. It was only fair. And even by the international laws also, if they were citizens of a state who had been informed of the rules and the laws and regulations of a state, but they still chose to disobey, then the state authorities, they are definitely entitled to punish and to deal with the disobedience uh, strictly because this would, is, this would be needed to terminate the malice they were creating in the state by their disobedience. So this was not an unfair law, and this was according to all the interna international laws also. 
And so uh, going through the basic rules, I think if we read the basic messages of uh, the verses, we'll be able to understand now what the declara uh, declaration was actually about. So now in verse two, Allah says, so travel freely, O disbelievers, throughout the land during the four months, but know that you cannot cause failure to Allah and that Allah will disgrace the believers. And it is an announcement from Allah and his messengers to the people on the day of the greater pilgrimage that Allah is disassociated from disbelievers and so is his messenger. So if you repent, that is the best for you. But if you turn away, then know that you will not cause failure to Allah and give tidings to those who disbelieve of a painful punishment. Here in the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the words of the day of great pilgrimage has been called as Hajj Akbar. What does this mean? Some say that it, it is a term for the Hajj on the day of Friday. They say that when the Hajj comes on the day of Friday, it is Hajj Akbar. And they also assume that the reward for the Hajj of Friday, which they label as Hajj Akbar, is double as compared to the Hajj on any other day of the week. This is not correct. This is not correct because this is not proven by any teaching of Quran or Hadith. Because, you know, firstly, it does not seem fair. Some people, by sheer coincidence, getting a double reward as compared to the other performing Hajj, the preceding or the later years, doesn't somehow seem fair. Secondly, if it had been so that the Hajj which came on Friday had a double reward, it would be, there would be a huge number of people gathering to perform Hajj to get the double reward. And so the load on the days of Hajj would increase multiple times and would increase tremendously, creating a colossal management issues and extreme overcrowding. And the third reason as a proof, which I can quote, which is proven by the calendar also, that the Hajj, which was performed in the 9 AH, was not on Friday. It was actually a manner of the Arabs that they called Umrah as the minor or the smaller Hajj, and they called Hajj as the greater Hajj, or Hajj Akbar. So it was just because of this, it was not a Hajj on Friday, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is announcing here. So if you repent, that is the best for you. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking the disbelievers to repent and to convert to Islam and accept the messages of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Accepted are those with whom you made a treaty among the polytheists, and then they have not been different towards you in anything or supported anyone against you. So complete for them their treaty until their term has ended. Indeed, Allah loves the raised who, uh, righteous who fear him. Verse number five, and when the sacred months have passed, then kill the polytheists wherever you find them and capture them and besiege them and sit in waiting for them at every place of ambush. But if they should repent, establish prayer and give zakah, let them go on their way. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Now, this verse, this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that when these months have passed, which months, the four, uh, the four months of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned as a waiting period for the disbelievers when they were allowed to carry on staying in Mecca for observing and deciding whether they want to convert to Islam or not. It is not referring to the fourth sacred months mentioned in Quran. So when these four months pass off, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching the Muslims a manner how they need to relate to the people who still prefer disbelieving. Remember this verse is often 
quoted. It is quoted by all those who try to make an effort and who are working to defame the teachings of Quran and Islam. They who are labeling Quran, Islam, and Prophet Sallallahu and his teachings as promoting terrorism. They say that Quran teaches, the teachings of Quran, they promote terrorism. They say that Islam is a religion of terrorism. They say that Muslims are all what? They are terrorists. And then labeling all this and making all these accusations and allegations, they say that see in Quran, they quote this verse number five of Surah Tawbah, and they say that see in Quran, the Muslims are being openly ordered to wait and to wait and uh, to besiege and get hold of the non-Muslims and take them captives and kill them. But remember, this is not so. This is actually not so. Because, you know, when, when just a part of a sentence or a dialogue is taken and it is used and it is interpreted, it will not convey the actual and the true message and will for sure give a, a false message. And this is so not only for Quran, but also for any book or any literature in any language. We need to repeat and we need to read and we need to go through the complete sentence. And moreover, we also need to relate to the reference to the context. We need to relate and understand the reference to the context in which that thing is being said to understand the correct and the whole message. For example, just giving you an example, like in Surah Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La taqrabu salata. It means that Allah is saying that you just don't, you just stay away from salah. But until and unless we read the complete verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining and narrating the conditions when Muslims are being told to stay away from salah. Until and unless we read the complete sentence and until and unless we relate, we relate to the reference in which the verse was revealed, we will not be able to understand the correct and the whole and the true message of the verse. So here, the order of taking captives and killing the non-Muslims is for whom? This by no means, the worst by no means is implying or ordering the Muslims that internationally the Muslims are being ordered to attack the innocent non-Muslim citizens who are totally at peace. May be in the streets of New York or Paris or London and then the Muslims are being ordered to attack and to captivate these innocent non-Muslim citizens of all the non-Muslim countries and then go about killing them? No, for sure, this is not the message in the order of this, Quran, this verse of Surah Tawbah. This order is for those who were given, who were graciously granted four months of waiting period and if they haven't accepted Islam, despite being announced, and they still are not vacating Makkah also, according to the Lord, uh, according to the laws and the rules of the state, which had been explained to them previously, they do not vacate Makkah. They do not convert, and they still stay on in the religious center of the Muslims, wanting or trying to create malice this is the order to deal with those specific people in those specific condition. The worst is misguided and it is misinterpreted. misinterpreted. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with the knowledge and the ability to stop all these defaming tactics and the anti-Islam agencies at all the levels and to clarify these situations to all the Muslims also who are being misguided. They read, they listen to them and they go through their literature and they uh, open up the Quran and they find that this verse is very much there in Quran and they are misguided. 
by all the malice that they are creating. Help us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to do to clarify all these defaming tactic, tactics which are being used against the Quran to misguide the Muslims. And if anyone of the polity is seeks your protection, then grant him protection so that he might hear the words of Allah, then deliver him to his place of safety. This is because they are people who do not know. Verse 7, how can there be for the polytheists a treaty in the sight of Allah and with his messenger except for those with whom you made a treaty at Al-Masjid Al-Haram? So as long as they are upright towards you, be upright towards them. Indeed, Allah loves the righteous who fear Allah. How can there be a treaty while if they gain dominance over you, they do not observe concerning you any pact of kinship or covenant of protection? They satisfy you with their mouths, but their hearts refuse compliance, and most of them are defiantly disobedient. They have exchanged the signs of Allah for a small price and averted pre people from his way. Indeed, it was evil that they were doing. And they do not observe towards a believer any pact of kinship or covenant of protection, and it is they who are the transgressors. But if they repent, establish prayer, and give zakah, then they are your brothers in religion, and we detail the verses for people who know. And if they break their oaths after their treaty and defame your religion, then fight the leaders of disbelief. For indeed, there are no oaths sacred to them. Fight them that they might cease. Would you not fight a people who broke their oaths and determined to expel the messenger? And they had begun the attack upon you the first time. Do you fear them? But Allah has more right that you should fear him if you are truly believers. Fight them. Allah would punish them by your hands and will disgrace them and give you victory over them and satisfy the breasts of believing people. And, remi and remove the fury in the believers' hearts. And Allah turns in forgiveness to whom he wills. And Allah is knowing and wise. Do you think that you will be left as you are? While Allah has not yet made evident those among you who strive for his cause and do not take others other than Allah, his messenger and the believers as inmates. And Allah is acquainted with what you do. Verse number 17. It is not for the polytheists to maintain the masks of Allah while witnessing against themselves with disbelief. For those, their deeds have become worthless and in the fire will they abide eternally. This verse is what has announced. So it is this verse which announced that non-Muslims not allowed in Mecca. This is a piece of land. Mecca will be a piece of land till the day of judgment on earth where only we, the followers of Prophet Sallallahu will enter and reside. Alhamdulillah, subhanallah, how elevated and how blessed should we feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us realize our duties and our responsibilities of being of being blessed with this position and being given with this special right of Allah the mosques of Allah are only to be maintained by those who believe in Allah and the last day and they do what establish prayer and give zakat and do not fear except Allah for it is expected that those will be rightly guided. Verse 19, have you made the providing of water for the pilgrims and the maintaining of masjid -e haram equal, equal to the deeds of one who has believed in Allah and the last day and strives in the cause of Allah? 
they are not equal in the sight of Allah and Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. The ones who believed emigrated and striven in the cause of Allah with their wealth and their lives are greater in ranks in the sight of Allah. And it is those who are the attainers of success. The Lord gives them good tidings of mercy from him and approval and of gardens for them wherein is enduring pleasure and they will be abiding therein forever. Indeed, Allah has with him a great reward. So in these verses, especially the verse number 19, there is the response and the answer to the criticism by the non-Muslim residents of Mecca who were being disgraced and they were being asked to vacate Mecca. They were criticizing the law and the rule which had been announced by Prophet Sallallahu in these verses of Quran. And so here Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is answering the criticism by those non-believers. You know what happened was that when this order came that if they preferred to stay in a state of disbelief, then they will be they will be supposed to vacate Makkah because non-Muslims not allowed in Mecca. They started raising a hue and cry, and they were saying that they, they and their ancestors, they had been the inhabitants of Mecca since so many generations. And moreover, they claimed that they have been the servants of Haram and the pilgrims since so many centuries performing the duties of keeping haram clean and serving and providing food and drinks to the pilgrims. So how, how can they be turned out all of a sudden one fine morning without taking in considerations their age old services of them as well as of their ancestors? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here comments that they just they are just taking a few apparent rituals as the total religions, as the total obedience. Religion does not mean, or religion does not demand just a few rituals of feeding or of providing drinks to the pilgrims or just trying to keep the haram clean. And no, religion or Islam does not demand or ask and is not just about a few apparent rituals. It is what it is actually believing, having faith, and then being obedient and just striving and struggling in the path of Allah for the pleasure of Allah. So that is being made clear that their concept of religion is just superficial and artificial. Verse 23, O you who have believed, do not take your fathers and your brothers as allies if they have preferred disbelief over belief. And whoever does so among you, then it is those who are the wrongdoers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here negating a wrongdoing and is guiding the Muslims very clearly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining all of us how we need to reorder and reframe our priorities of love and obedience, even with our near and dear ones. As Allah is saying that if you, if you take, do not take your fathers and your brothers as allies, if they are preferring disbelief over belief. So this is what? This is a law, a don't regarding the, uh, the mutual human relationships of Muslims. As I have already explained in the previous sessions that there are four types of human relationships and the relationship of Valayat, Vali, is what is being explained here. Vali is whom? Vali, if I... Revise is a nearest and a dearest loved one who is consulted 
from whom we take advice relating our issues and our uh, different uh, problems of our lives. We consult them and we take advice from them. We follow them, we obey them, we copy them or we idolize them. We share our secrets with the person and we have common interests and we have common um, entertainments also. So here, we all Muslims are being stopped to have valayat or to make wali with whom? That is make a heartfelt bond even with our fathers or our brothers if they prefer to be in a state of disobedience to Allah rather than obeying Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If even our brothers and fathers or our mothers or sisters, they prefer state of disobedience to obedience, a state of transgression to state of submission, then we need not make them or we need to stay away from even taking them as our wali. This is very important. This is extremely important to save our iman and faith. For example, if a person, I, I generally try to make it clear with examples. Imagine there's a person, there is a person, there's a man who reads Quran and goes through the verses of Surah Al-Baqarah and reads and learns how, how strictly and how firmly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made usury or interest prohibited and unlawful. But the person, after going through these verses and clearly understanding how unlawful consuming usury or taking interest is, then goes and discusses with one of his brothers or his father that he intends leaving all forms of interest in his business, in his business transactions, in his business dealings. And he consults his brother or father that what is he supposed to do? And the brother and the father, they are unaware of the orders of Allah regarding interest or usury. Obviously, very obviously, their spontaneous reaction, their spontaneous advice will be what? They will obviously tell him, don't you ever imagine taking this decision. It will, it will like just ruin your business. You, you offer salah and you perform, you, you fast and you perform hajj. And that should, you, that should be just sufficient for you to be a Muslim. Don't you just go about leaving usury and this will just spoil all the business you are carrying out so successfully. Similarly, there is a woman. There's a lady, she reads Surah Al-Ahzab and she, she goes through the messages of Surah Nur and then moved by the orders, she decides that she will start observing Parda and she will adopt the whale also. And she happens to talk to her sister who obviously has not read the teachings of Quran. What will be her reaction? What will be the advice? Obviously, very obviously, she will clearly say, don't you start wearing this hijab or wheel. You will be labeled as a fanatic. You will be a social misfit. Your job, your promotion will suffer. Your husband will be offended. And your husband might just lose interest in you and might just get involved in other women and so on and so forth. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling all of us that even if our near and dear ones, how near ever they might be, if they are prefer, preferring a state of disbelief and disobedience, to believe and obedience, then we are not going to take them as our wali. And so in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing us to analyze our preferences and priorities of our mutual love and our mutual affection. Allah says, say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives, in kana aba ukum wa abna ukum wa ihran ukum wa azwajukum wa ashiratukum and your relatives, 
و اموال و نیک تعریف تموها و تجارت و تخشو نکی سادها و مساکین و ترزونها احبا الیکم من الله و رسوله و جهاد فی سبیله فتربسو اللہ says that if your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives, your relatives and the wealthy which you have obtained the trade, the commerce we are in wherein you fear the decline and the dwellings with which you are pleased. They are, all of these things are more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger and, and striving for jihad in the cause of Allah. Then wait, then wait until Allah executes his command. And one command did Allah execute and, ex- execute and said what? And Allah does not guide the defiantly, does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in this verse has mentioned a list of what we learned previously in Quran, hubbu shahawat, all those things which are attracting, which are attractive, they are the tempting things of this worldly life. That is, that is, are all are loved and near dear ones, our wealth, our riches, the gold, the silver, the cash, the currency, the business, the trade, the house. If our loved and desired things, if the love and the desires of all these worldly things, it exceeds our love for Allah, for Prophet ﷺ and the desire to struggle and strive for jihad in the path of Allah, then what will happen is that the decision for our forgiveness, the decision of our being loved by Allah, then the decision of Allah has been postponed. Allah has postponed. The decision is, has been like later on but one decision has Allah clearly announced that all those having such wrong primary priorities of their life, they are disobedient. They are the disobedience and Allah will deprive and Allah will deprive all of these disobedient people who have set wrong priorities and preferences of their loves in this worldly life. Allah will deprive them of his guidance. Allahumma la taj'alla minhum. Allahumma inni as'aluka, as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuka wa amal allazi yuballighuni hubbaka. Allahumma ihtina sirat al-mustakeem. Allahumma alhimna rushtan wa aizna min shuroori anfusina. اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعا اللهم أرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابا Now let me relate this to our normal day-to-day lives and relate this with some situations where we behave in this manner. For example, family time. Family time, our family get-togethers when our family like our mom or sister comes over to see us and we're all sitting together and we come up saying that my my sister you just wait for a few minutes and I shall be back in a minute after offering my salah really actually hurrying up with salah to come and sit with the mother and the sister as a preference preferring sitting and talking and chatting with the mother and the sister over over our meeting with Allah, over our meeting with the sustainer and the creator, because that is what actually Salah is. To prolong the meeting and the sitting with the mother and the sister, making short, cutting short the Salah, this is very frequent. And then another situation which we frequently come across around us, trying to please the children at the cost of the displeasure of Allah, being more bothered, being more bothered and concerned about the queries of the family, of the siblings or the friends 
more than the queries and the accountabilities of Allah Maliki Yawmiddin on the day of judgment. Attending to, spending time for, for efforts of business, attending to the businesses, spending time and effort for the businesses, for the trade, for the job, more than spending the same time for congregational salah, learning, learning of Quran or any form of striving or struggling for jihad in any way. All this shows what? These are the wrong preferences and priorities which are being demonstrated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all, guide us all, protect us all. Allahumma alhimna rushdan wa aizna min shiruri anfusina. Verse number 25, Allah has already given you victory in many regions and even on the day of Hunayn when your great number pleased you, but it did not avail you at all. And the earth was confining for you with its vastness. Then you turned back fleeing. So here in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about uh, Ghazba that took place after the conquest of Makkah, the battle of Hunan. Now, a brief narration of the battle of Hunan is that in the eighth year after immigration, when there was the conquest of Makkah, and Prophet ﷺ was staying in Makkah for a few days after the conquest of Makkah, a huge number of people embraced Islam in Makkah and uh, also from around the suburbs of Mecca. There were two tribes, Banu Saqif and Banu Hawazan. They still had not accepted Islam and they were bitter enemies of Prophet ﷺ. They realized very cleverly and very analytically, they realized a situation that this was an, acu this was an acu uh, occasion this was an occasion when there was the there was the largest get together of Muslims in Makkah, and the Muslims they also realized the people of Hunain they also realized that the Muslims under the current situation they were preoccupied and they were involved in the events following the conquest and their victory, and they were hence somewhat they were unaware of the enemies attacking them from around them. So they thought that if at this situation and this time, if they attacked Makkah and the Muslims, they will be taken unaware. So they thought that this was like a golden opportunity to finish off a huge strength of Muslims. And they also thought that this might be one of the last chances to do so. Because if, if after this, if the Muslims spread and they were allowed to spread after this, they might become even stronger and it might become even more impossible to, to sue, suppress them or to control them. So they planned to attack the Muslims unaware in Makkah. Now, what happened was that Prophet Wasallam was sent a revelation and was given information by the Alimul Ghaib, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the intentions of the people of Banu Hawaz. And uh, he was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to start preparing for attack of the people of the tribe. And so, Allah, so Prophet Wasallam ordered for the preparation of the army. And uh, what happened was that there was a huge number of companions who had come from Medina. And now there was a massive conversion of the Muslims from Mecca also. And all the sincere companions and the new converts also, all these new converts, they were regretting their delay of accepting Islam. And so when Prophet Sallallahu announced that they, he was going to go for war, the companions coming from Medina and even these new converts, they readily, they agreed for the war. So with a huge army of 12,000 Muslims, never 
ever there had been such a great number of Muslims for war. So with this huge army of 12,000 Muslims, they marched towards Banu Hawazin and Banu Saqif. Now, what happened actually was that some of the Muslims, they developed a feeling of overconfidence. And they thought that they will be, the battle is going to be like, easy peasy for all of them. And it's going to be like extra easy for them this time. They, they thought and they remembered that when they had in battle of Badr, they were one third as compared to the army of Abu Jahl. They had come out victorious. And now this occasion, they were in such a huge number and strength. So the battle is just going to be with just two small tribes. And this is going to be like no big deal for them. What is this? They had just started relying on their own power and their own strength and number. Other than relying on Allah, his help and his power. And then there was also a little bit of like arrogance rather than being humble. This, these both these feelings were disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they were punished. And the purpose of this punishment was to train them for what is better as feeling and as a frame of mind. So what happened was that the army, the army of Banu Hawazin and Banu Saqif, they had export, they had export archers. And uh, with, a, with an excellent military strategy, they stationed and they they positioned the expert archers around the road, which led to the city of the two tribes. And they camouflaged these archers and the archers, they were instructed to start a shower of arrows when the Muslim army, they crossed and they went, they came to this road and this path. So that is exactly what happened was that when the Muslim army advanced towards this road, all of a sudden, there was as if there was a rain of arrows from the sky. Out of the blue, there, was, there were arrows being uh, showered on them from all the sides. The Muslims were taken unaware and they were like shocked. And so what happened is that most of the army of the Muslims, they fled in terror and in total shock and panic. Prophet Sallallahu just like the battle of Uhud, he was left alone and he was not protected also. And he was calling out, Ilayya ibadullah, Ilayya ibadullah, O servants of Allah, come towards me. But most of them were not responding as if they were not just hearing anything at all. But there were just a few who would respond who responded in the return to protect Prophet Sallallahu And then after they were taught the lesson to train them, then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made them all drowsy. And they do report, the companions report that we were so drowsy that we, were, we used to raise our arms and our hands in which we had our swords to attack the enemy, but our hands or our arms, they would just not rise. And they were, they were continuously dropping by our sides. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them all drowsy and sleep encompassed them. And uh, angels descended by the order of Allah and they took over the battle. And finally, the Muslims were victorious. So what lesson and what morals do we learn from here is that it is the worldly victory and the success is not dependent on the strength or the number or the arms or the ammunition, but on the help and on the will of Allah. Nathrum min Allah. Victories are with the help, with the support, with the guidance, and with the, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
then what happened Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now commenting on the conditions of battle of Hunan then Allah sent down his tranquility upon his messenger and upon the believers and sent down soldiers angels whom you did not see and punished those who disbelieved and that is the recompense of the disbelievers then Allah will accept repentance after that for whom he wills and Allah is <clears throat> Allah is forgiving and merciful <clears throat> Verse 28, O you who have believed, indeed the polytheists are unclean, so let them not approach al-Masjid al-Haram after this, their final year, and if you fear privation, indeed, indeed Allah will enrich you from his bounty if he wills, indeed Allah is knowing and wise. This verse 28, Allah has ordered that non-Muslims will not be allowed to stay in Makkah, clear announcing that they will vacate Makkah. All those people who will choose to be disbelievers, they will vacate Makkah. They will not enter Makkah in future. The pilgrimage or the Hajj will not be performed according to the customs and rituals of the people of Makkah or the people of Quraysh. And pilgrimage will not be done as they did according to their manners and they will be no longer also the guardians and the servants of haram that is they were superseded from this responsibility also verse 29 fight those who do not believe in allah or in the last day and who do not consider unlawful what is what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who were given the scriptures fight fight until they give jizya willingly while they are humbled so remember according to the teachings of this verse non-muslims not allowed in Makkah we've learned clearly but from this verse, we learn that non-Muslims can otherwise reside in Islamic cities and Islamic countries. All the Islamic cities and all the Islamic countries can the non-Muslims reside and they can stay and they can carry on their normal day-to-day -day practices also. Moreover, the Muslims are to behave with total religious tolerance will all the non-Muslim citizens of the Muslim states. But the non-Muslims in a Muslim states are like what, as this verse says, Bahum Swagirun. Bahum Swagirun means that the non-Muslims residing in a Muslim state, they will be what? They will be as second grade citizens or minority populations. They, instead of zakat, they will be supposed to pay jizya to the Islamic state. The reason is, as Allah says, why are they supposed to uh, stay as hum sagirun and pay jizya instead of zakat is because of the behaviors, because of their faith. Allah says, the Jews say that Uzair is a son of Allah and the Christians say that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam is a son of Allah. That is their statement from their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieve before them. May Allah destroy them. How are they deluded? And another behavior by them is that they have taken their scholars and monks as lords besides Allah. And also Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, the son of Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam. And they were not commanded except to worship one Allah. There is no deity except him exalted is he about whatever they associate with him they want to extinguish the light of allah with their mouths but allah has ref allah refuses except to perfect his light although the disbelievers dislike it it is he who has sent his messengers with guidance and the religion of truth to manifest it over all religions, although they who associate others with Allah dislike it. Verse number 34. 
Oh, you who have believed, indeed, many of the scholars and monks devour the wealth of people unjustly and avert them from the way of Allah and those who hold gold and silver and spend it not in the way of Allah, give them tidings of a punish of a painful punishment. So the first part of the verse uh, is explaining that the dis honest status of the scholars of the people of the book and what was their uh, untrustworthy behavior was that they did not keep the trust and they would consume the money which people had spent for charity the people of the book when they spent in charity or when they spent in the path of allah then the scholars being uh, distrustful and uh, they did not keep trust they used to consume this money of charity spent by the people in the path of allah and the last part of the verse negates this clearly negates the holding of wealth the holding of riches without paying the rights the due rights of allah on the wealth gold silver riches and cash of the person and it also mentions the punishment of all those indulging in such a behavior. And the punishment is mentioned in the next verse, verse number 35, where Allah says, Allah says, the day when it will be heated in the fire of hell, and seared or stamped therewith will be their foreheads, their flanks, and their bodies. It will be said, this is what you hoarded for yourselves, so taste what you used to hold. So in the previous verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has negated holding of the wealth and riches without paying the rights of Allah on the wealth blessed by the sustainer of all the worlds. Allah is mentioning the condition of yaknizuna, kaf nun za. This means what? It means a hoarded wealth. And a hoarded wealth like which? For which the master holds and keeps it as a secret. Why? In case someone might find out and a needy person may just ask for arms. Moreover, guns is a trayer which is hoarded without paying the due rights of zakat and without spending in the path of Allah also. So the wealth which has been hoarded and the person or the master of the hoarded wealth does not pay the due zakat and is also a miser enough not to pay charity in the path of Allah also. This miserliness and this stinginess to the extent of not even paying the obligatory zakat, this will be severely punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And here Allah is saying what? That all this wealth, it will be heated. It will be heated up on the fire of hell. We all know that by traditions, Prophet has clearly told us and announced that the hellfire is going to be 69 times higher temperature than the fire of this world. So a fire which is 69 times hotter than the fire here, all that gold and silver plates, it will be, it will be heated there and then it will be stamped. The forehead will be stamped. Why the forehead? Because when, when the needy people, when the have-nots, they used to beg for help for the master, for the to, to the master of all this hoarded wealth, the needy and the poor and the orphans and the have-nots, they used to they used to beg for help. Then the person he used to dislike it, and there used to be a frown on the forehead with the sign of dislike. And so the forehead which shown, which showed the signs of disapproval, that will be stamped. And then the flanks will be stamped. 
because when the person who was the owner of all this hoarded this hoarded wealth when the person heard the request of the needy not only did he dislike disliked or he disapproved but he also turned his side as if he was just not bothered the same flags which we use to turn around them they will be stamped and the backs will be stamped finally why because he used to walk back on them he used to turn around turn his back and leave the needy unattended so the back of the hard hearted person they will be stamped and we learn from quran in surah in surah al imran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also mentioned the punishment for all those who behaved like a miser or who were stingy Allah says wala yahsabanna allazina yabkhuluna bima atahumu Allahu min fadlihi huwa khairul lahum bal huwa sharrul lahum sayutaddaqun Allah says all those people who act as misers who are stingy don't don't consider the stinginess as something which is good for them in fact it is what it is evil it is bad as a result for all of them because this all wealth which they will save up which they will hold up because of this stinginess and this miserliness this will be what this will be this will be turned into bands around their necks on the day of judgment on and what will these bands sayutawqun what will these bands be explains a tradition a prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in bukhari and muslim prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been reported to say that on the day of judgment all those who had not spent zakat and in the path of allah then all this wealth will take the shape of what of a bald snake who will have two black spots on his eyes and this black bald snake will do what it will encircle their necks like a band and it will get hold of their mouth and it will tear the edges and the corners of the mouth and the snake will say what ana maluka ana kanzuka i am the wealth i am the wealth you hold it so this will be the punishment and then as this verse allah says that it will be heated up and it will be stamped there is a very lengthy hadith of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which explains how they will be how they will be stamped and i will be narrating it in my own words it has been related in bukhari that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that on the day of resurrection all the people who had collected gold and silver and had not paid their zakat they will be made to lay down with their faces on the ground and then their backs will be the backs will be what they will be seared with the plates of gold and silver which have been roasted on hell fire and when they will cool down they will again be heated up on the hell fire and this will continue for 1000 years till there will be decision for people to go to the hell or to the jannah and then the camels all the people who had camels and there was due zakat but they had not paid their zakat then on the day of judgment these camels they will come with much increased sizes and they will crush them with their feet and they will bite them with their mouth and they will howl and this will continue for 100 for 1000 years till people will take their way either towards the hell or towards the jannah and those who had goats and had not paid their due zakat the goats will also come and they will they will stampede them and they will tear them with their horns and they will crush them with their hooves and they will howl and they will cry and this will continue for 1000 years allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand all this remember all this relate to all this and save ourselves from this punishment prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's tradition tells all of us that he said that every morning and every evening two angels in the heaven they supplicate they call out to allah and they say oh allah oh allah multiply the wealth of those who spend in the path of allah 
blessed with blessed with the mercy and blessings and multiply the wealth of all those who stand in the path of Allah and destroy the wealth of all those who do not spend in the path of Allah. People generally do not spend in the path of Allah for the fear of the player being depleted, that the player, yeah, that the that the all the treasure it will be depleted. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam promised. He said, biyadihi nafsi." By the word of Allah, the wealth will not decrease by spending in the path of Allah. And respect and regard and status will not decrease if we forgive a person. Rather, Allah raises Allah raises the standard of those who stay humble. Allahumma ja'alni sabura wa ja'alni shakura. Rabbi aini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Verse number 36. Indeed, the number of months with Allah is 12 lunar months in the register of Allah from the day he created the heavens and the earth. Of these, four are the sacred months. That is the correct religion. So do not wrong yourselves during them and fight against the disbelievers collectively as they fight against you collectively and know that Allah is with the righteous who fear him. In the verse 36, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the four sacred months. These months are the month of Rajab, Zilqad, Zihaj, and Muharram. These four months in which killing, looting, plundering in any form has been prohibited. And the purpose of prohibiting all these activities in these four months is basically or was basically to ensure the safety and the safe journey of the pilgrims of Hajj. But what the people of Makkah did was <clears throat> to disobey this order of the sacred months. They did so in two ways. And these are the two ways of Nasi. The first was that they used to, as we will be reading in the next uh, verse, that they used to disrupt the sanctity of a sacred month. And they used to attack a trade caravan to get money and to get the riches. And instead, they, should, they used to make another month sacred. So they used to make uh, a month which was not sacred. They used to make it sacred, and the month which uh, and the month which was sacred, they used to break the sanctity of this month. So making the lawful unlawful and making the unlawful as lawful is what they were doing. And the second thing, how they went about these sacred months was to ensure to ensure that the season of the Hajj would not change. They would add a month. They would add a month of the Kabisa after every three years. And this would make the lunar calendar equal to the solar calendar so that the months would not change in season. Because we know that in the lunar calendar, the months of the year change in different seasons. There are times when the month of Ramadan is in summers and there is time when it is in the winters. There is time when Hajj is in the winters and there is time when Hajj is in the summers. But this is what the people of Makkah did not want. They wanted that the Hajj should stay in just one season. And which season? They wanted that the Hajj would always come in the months of harvest of their dates and the date crops so that they could avail of the sale and the earns from their agricultural returns also. So this was cross disobedience i repeat again what they did what did they do was that after every 3 years they added a month they added a month of kabisa so that the hajj would always stay in the same season and they would avail their business advantages so this is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has negated allah says Indeed, the postponement, the postponing of restrictions within the sacred months is an increase in disbelief by which those who have disbelieved are led further astray. They make it lawful one year and unlawful another year to correspond to the number made unlawful by Allah and thus make lawful what Allah has made unlawful. 
made pleasing to him is the evil of their deeds and Allah does not guide the disbelieving people. O oh, you who have believed, what is the matter with you that when you are told to go forth in the cause of Allah, you adhere heavily to the earth? Are you satisfied with the life of this world rather than hereafter? But what is the enjoyment of worldly life compared to the hereafter except a very little? So from here onwards starts the second part of the revelation of Surah at tawbah And these were the verses which were revealed during the time when the preparation for the Tabuk expedition was in progress. In this verse also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is motivating and encouraging the Muslims for the for proceeding for the battle of the book and is indirectly inquiring the reason for their defaulting or not wanting to do so. Now, I would just um, stop here to narrate the main events of the battle of the book before we go through the verses so that it will assist us understand the meaning and comprehend the message of the verses more easily. Repeating the history in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was blessed with prophethood initially there was a secret invitation and then he secretly conveyed the message but then he was asked to announce and invite the people initially there was just a failure of acceptance but slowly and steadily did they start making fun and mocking prophet وسلم, and then the refusal became stronger and finally ended up with uh, with oppression and persecution and criticism and negation and finally allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after 13 years of stay in Makkah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him to emigrate from Makkah to Medina. And here an Islamic state of Medina was established. In the first year after the immigration to Medina, were they allowed and permitted? And then in the second year, were they ordered to do Qital? In the second year was the Battle of Badr. In the third year was the Battle of Uhud. In the fifth year was the Battle of Ahzab or Trench. And then after that, in the fifth year, Prophet Sallallahu very truly announced that now from onwards from here in future, the people of Quraysh will not attack Medina. And that is exactly what how the state of affairs turned out to be. In sixth year, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was ordered to perform Umrah and he proceeded to do so with his companions and there was signed the Treaty of Hadebia. After the Treaty of Hadebia, since there was a no war pact with the Quraysh of Makkah, so Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi since he was at a no war pact with the people of Makkah, he started proceeding with other war expeditions. And in the seventh year, there was the Battle of Khaybar, the Khaybar expedition, where there was a victory for the Muslims against the Jews. And then in uh, Prophet Sallallahu life, he kept on because of a no war pact, he was comparatively, Medina was comparatively peaceful. So Prophet Sallallahu had the time, he had the energy to start sending groups to the surrounding cities and states, inviting them towards Islam. Because the manner of Prophet Sallallahu is what? to keep on working, struggling for the preaching and teaching and implementation and protection of Islam. Now, according to all these activities, a group of 15 people led by Hazrat Qab bin Umair Ghafari was sent towards the north. And these were the borders of Syria and all the members of the group were killed except the leader. Then there was another group which was sent to invite other people, this group of uh, people, of the companions of Prophet Sallallahu the leader was, uh, they were sent, they were sent to uh, the ruler or the leader of Busra, that is Shurjil bin Amr. And uh, this group 
was led by Haris bin Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this time, the leader of the group, Hazrat Haris bin Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was martyred. And we all know that the killing of the, or assassination of the ambassador actually means what? It means actually openly declaring or announcing a war. So this, seeing this behavior by the Romans that they had killed the ambassador, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also declared war against the Romans. And he therein, he ordered for the preparation of the army. An army of 3,000 soldiers was prepared, but on this occasion, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself did not accompany them in this expedition. But uh, before he left the army, the army left Medina, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed them, and uh, he told them regarding the descending order of command for the army. Hazrat Jafar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was appointed as the army chief to start with. And then Prophet Sallallahu instructed that if Hazrat Jafar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was martyred, then Hazrat Zaid bin Haris radiallahu ta'ala anhu will take up the command. And even if he got martyred, then Abdullah bin Rawaha radiallahu ta'ala anhu was suggested as the third in command. The courageous companions in a number of 3,000, they left Medina and they reached Mota. And in Mota, they were faced with an army of one lakh Roman soldiers. There was a ratio of one is to 33. Despite this ratio of one is to 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed these courageous companions as a remarkable victory. While in Medina, Residing in Medina, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was narrating the whole events of Mu'tah as he was, continually be, he was continuously being informed. And um, he, was, he was telling all his companions that he was narrating the whole events. And he said that it is Hazrat Jafir who, who is the flag bearer and he has the flag in his right hand. And then he immediately informed that his right hand has been cut off and he has shifted the flag to the left hand. And then he informed that now his left hand has also been cut off. And then he's holding the flag with the stump of both the arms, trying to protect the owner of the Muslim flag. He was holding it with the stump of both arms. And then his Prophet Salaam added and informed that now Hazrat Jafir bin Abu Talib he was what? He was the paternal cousin of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the brother of Hazrat Ali Razillahu Ta'ala who Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed that now he has been martyred. And he also was informed and he, in a revolution. And then he shared it with the companions that I have been told that by the order of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he has been blessed with two wings with which he has flown to Jannah. And Hazrat Jafar was given as the title of Jafar Tayyar. That is Jafar radiallahu ta'ala and who, who flew like birds to the Jannah. And then he was given the title of Jafar Zul Jannah Hatayn, the one with two wings, wings like birds. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam announced that the next two chiefs, they were also martyred one after the other. And this time, by this time, Hazrat Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala and who he had accepted in Islam and he had joined the Muslim army and he was in the battle of Mu'ta also. So the companions, they asked and they requested Hazrat Khalid bin Walid, knowing his military skills, they requested him to take command. Initially, Hazrat Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala and who he refused, but uh, later he agreed. And he took up the command and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Muslims the victory under the command of Hazrat Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And you remember, and you know what happened in the following years? What happened, what used to happen in the following years was that any army which was led by Hazrat Khalid bin Walid used to come out victorious. And he was given the title of Saifullah, the sword of Allah. And what happened was that People during the caliphate of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who they started associating victory with Hazrat Khalid bin Walid. And they started associating that if uh, an army was led by Khalid bin Walid, 
it will obviously come out victorious. Now, when Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he saw all this, that victory, people had started associating it with Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he immediately superseded him as a soldier rather than being an army chief. And how humble was Hazrat Khalid? He still continued fighting. He still continued going in all the war sessions. He continued humbly. Because the purpose of his jihad was not self-projection. The purpose of his, all his jihad was not power or authority. But his purpose was surely what? Just the player of Allah, the acquiring of Jannah through martyrdom. And when the Muslims were now victorious in Mota, the Romans did what? The Roman army, after retreating, while they were retreating, they announced that they will fight the next year also. So in ninth year, Prophet Wasallam announced a war against the Roman, accepting, accepting their challenge very gallantly. It was extremely difficult. This Tabuk expedition was an extremely difficult difficult, one of the most difficult expeditions in the life of Prophet The difficulties being that number one, the army, the army the Muslims were going to face and fight was a superpower of the time, the powerful Romans, the Christian state. Secondly, the book was very far away and it needed a very long journey. And moreover, this journey was unknown to the Muslims of Medina. They had never, never, ever traveled towards Tabuk previously. And also, the journey was extremely difficult with tough terrains and hilly areas and rivers to be crossed. It was a very difficult and a very hard journey. And moreover, it was also unknown also. They had never traveled on this route also. And then, in all these situations, it was extremely, the summer was at its peak and it was very hot. People of Medina were almost struck by famine and there was a very bad form of economic crisis which was coexisting simultaneously also. But now the condition in Medina was that in the background of this famine and this economic crisis, the state of affairs was that the palm trees, they were loaded with bunches of ripe dates. Now, under these conditions, going for the Tabuk expedition and leaving the harvest to be done meant what? It obviously meant another year of famine, another year of food crisis, another year of economic crisis ahead. Now, under all these different situations and difficult situations, Prophet وسلم, by the order of Allah announced and declared what the jihad now with the Romans in the Tabuk expedition, jihad was declared obligatory. Meaning what? Meaning that all the Muslims without any genuine excuse could not stay behind. And if any adult man stayed behind without an excuse, then they would be labeled and they would be considered as hypocrites. Now, battle of the book. That is why during this Tabuk expedition, the during the period when it was being uh, prepared for and when prophet sallam came back also the hypocrites of medina they were uncovered and they came out clear cut from the believers and this was only when the call for obligatory jihad was made companions they rushed and the hypocrites they started creating their excuses lame excuses and they started telling lies so when there was a call for obligatory jihad, the companions, they rushed in groups. They were rushing to register their names as the Mujahideen, as the soldiers for the army of, of the expedition. And it was a sight-seeing experience. There were people 
who could not afford and they did not have any any riding animals and they would show interest and they would show intense desire to join the army but prophet sallallahu had to refuse taking them and they would ask other people to provide them their share of the ride or to provide them with animals or to share their rides with them but if they could not find anybody they were forced to return and their name was not registered and they were not happy to have escaped the hardship of the travel and the battle but they returned heavy hearted and they were crying tears rolling down we will go through the verses where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned has appreciated their sincerity and their sincere desires to join the tabuk expedition and the reason was just for the desire of the player of allah and just for entering jannah because they knew jannah is under the shade of swords and they knew the jannah has a door the door of jihad the babul jihad and they were wanting to do all this for the desire of martyrdom which would which would obviously be a source of expiation of all their sins with the falling of the first drop of their blood not only this but prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had ordered all the muslims of madina to spend for the jihad also because obviously this was needed for preparation of the arms and the knees for all the soldiers and the mujahideen also and how the how the companions of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they spent they spent for jihad in in competition with each other hazrat abdul rahman bin auf radhiyallahu ta'ala and who he was one of the wealthiest companions in medina and he brought a lot of stuff and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam inquired that abdullah uh, abdullah bin abi of he asked what he had left behind and he answered prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when i spend in the path of allah i don't see what i have left behind and when i spend in the path of allah i don't count what i have spent subhanallah this is how we need to spend with total faith and with total reliance of getting the reward hereafter hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he narrates that he had plenty and he wanted to do what fastabikul khairat he wanted to spend this time and excel what hazrat abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu spent he brought a lot of things with him and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him the same thing also that how much he had left for his family and in his house and he answered that i have brought half and i have left half for my family prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam accepted all from hazrat umar and he prayed for the acceptance and he prayed for the entrance of his of for his entrance in jannah and after some time the companions relate and narrate that abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala who came he came with his stuff and he was asked the same question by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he answered that he had he had left just the name and the remembrance of allah and his prophet at home and he had brought everything which he had in his home hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala in who he immediately cried out o oh, abu bakr you go and you stay ahead of me even this time again abu bakr's things and his stuff was no doubt lesser than hazrat abu bakr hazrat umar's stuff what he had brought but the sacrifice was greater the sincerity and the sacrifice was greater remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't doesn't see the quantity he sees the quality the intentions the sincerity and the sacrifice which is behind a virtuous and a righteous deeds and then there was hazrat usman radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he came he had 100 camels loaded with all forms of arms and ammunition and foods and rations for the battle and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was so happy seeing all that that he promised him jannah he promised him jannah and he also prayed for him hazrat usman overwhelmed by the tidings of jannah he went and he brought another 100 camels and then he 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 was so he was he received the same glad tidings from prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again 
And Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he repeated this act eight times. So he brought 800 camels eight times did he get the glad tidings of Jannah by the words of mouth of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. One fourth, one fourth of the expenditures of the Tabuk experience expedition was taken up by the son-in-law of Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So now with all this sincerity and with all these sacrifices with an army of 33,000 soldiers, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marched, toward, marched towards Tabuk. And there they were faced with an army of two lakh Romans. But what happened was that the Romans were thoroughly impressed. They were scared to death. And they realized, they just realized and they thought that the previous year in the expedition of Mauta, the Muslims were an army of 3,000. And even then, an army of 3,000 Muslims, they had defeated one lakh Romans. Now in Tabuk, they had come with 11 times greater strength and the Romans had only doubled up. And moreover, they also were realizing that now this Muslim army, which was 11 times in number as compared to Mota, they were also, these fanatics were now being led by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. So they were so scared that the Roman army of two lakh, they fled from the battlefield without fighting. The Muslim army did not even have to go through the danger of even a sword or a spear or an arrow, not even a drop of blood was shed. Muslim army came out victorious, unscathed, victorious without war. This is Allah and this is the help of Allah. And this accompanies and this befalls on those who are obedient who are patiently steadfast and who rely in the promises of Allah. They received the victory of Allah along with the pleasure of Allah also. And now we will go through the verses, inshallah. They will be much easier to comprehend as we have gone through the events. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining what Allah in this verse number 38 is asking all those who were refusing to join the army without any excuse, the reason of their default. And is it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also mentioned the reason himself that is it the love of the world, which is the deterring factor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here just scares them and warns them that if you do not go forth, he will punish you with a painful punishment and will replace you with another people and you will not harm him at all. And Allah is over all things competent. Verse number 40, if you do not aid the prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues his warning style that if Prophet sallallahu who has ordered all the Muslims without any excuse, uh, without any excuse, uh, excuse to proceed for the battle of uh, Tabuk and people are not, then here Allah is warning that if you do not aid the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah has already aided him when those when those who disbelieved had driven him out of Makkah as one of the two, when they were in the cave. And he said to his companion who was in the cave, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and who went at the night of immigration from Makkah, where in the cave of Sor, when they were in the cave and he said to his companion, La tahzan inna allaha ma'ana, do not grieve, indeed Allah is with us. And when a person believes 
And when a person relies on Allah, what happens is Allah sent down his tranquility upon him and supported him with angels you did not see and made the word of those who disbelieve the lowest while the words of Allah that is the highest and Allah is exalted in might and wise. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the events of immigration in the cave of Sor. What happened was that when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companion, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and who, who was willingly accompanying him in his emigration from Mecca, they were hiding and their hideout was the cave of Sor. The Meccans, they were, dis they were desperately looking for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and somehow they managed to reach the hideout of the cave. Remember, the cave of Sor is very shallow and it has a very wide opening. And they all what the people of Mecca they needed was they just needed to peep in and they would have seen Prophet Sallallahu and Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, there very much in the cave. And that is why Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq and who he got scared. But Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with his stronger faith and belief, he reassured and he said, La tahzanin Allah ma'ana. And Allah is with all those who have faith and who have reliance. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala held them by his order, a dove. A dove made a nest and a spider, um, it, uh, it wove its web and the Mecca, they got the people of Mecca, they got the impression that the cave was deserted and the cave had not been visited by anybody had not been entered by anybody since a long time so reaching that high on the cliff reaching the cave of sore all what they needed was just peeping in and they would have found everything black and white and they would have caught prophet for for what they had climbed all the way up but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got them into what he had planned and kept Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq Raziallahu Ta'ala and who safe. And that is how Allah helps all those who are reliant on Allah. Verse number 41, go forth. So explaining the whole situation, how Allah helps, Allah is now ordering, encouraging, go forth, go forth for what? For jihad, for fighting in the path of Allah, whether light or heavy, and strive with your wealth and your lives in the cause of Allah. That is better for you if you only know. Allah is ordering, motivating, encouraging in whatever conditions and whatever status they are. Was Rabbana la tuzi qulubana bada is kadaitana wa hablana milatun ka rahma in naka antal wahab subhanakallahuma babihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastak peruka banatu bo lake subhana wabbika rabbil aiza tiyamma yasipun was salamun alal mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen amin summa amin